for the the diseases, right? You said you can predict diseases ahead of time, and you can perhaps see uh, like diabetes coming. So, are you looking at um, ways at which we can commercialize that, or you could commercialize that, or or provide diagnostic okay. tools? So, we have to be very careful in wording here. Okay. So, uh, predicting a disease would be very specific. We can. Mm -hmm identify people who are at increased risk. Mm. This is not the same thing as predicting right. disease because what we would like to know is, you know, you are going to get disease A in 10 years. Nobody can tell you that. We can only tell you that you have increased risk of diabetes or you have increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. And we have to be very careful in interpreting what does it really mean? Because for example, if you have a twice as high risk for a specific cancer, which happens in one in a million of people, mm -hmm. then you're only two in a million of people. This is still a small risk. While a 20% increase in the risk of diabetes would be a high increase because 10 to 15% of us will eventually develop diabetes. So it's extremely important to um, not to misinterpret the, the biomarker data. And when we move into diagnostic arena, things are getting more and more regulated, especially in Europe. The new European regulation for uh, prognostic biomarkers is extremely strict and complicated, a little bit easier in US. And I think this is good because um, you know, giving people this type of information can actually be very harmful. So it's a little bit different for glycans than for genes because if somebody tells you, you have genes which are risk factor for disease, there's nothing you can really do. These genes will always be there. But the glycans you can change. So if you have glycans which are kind of uh, known risk factor for diseases, you can do something and change your glycans and then your risk goes down. So we are moving into that direction. Mm -hmm. So it, it will take some time for glycans to enter the routine diagnostics because um, Analytically, this is challenging, but now we have some uh, first uh, biomarkers being approved by the, by the FDA, by, by comp one company in US, mostly in the cancer field, and this will happen. So in five to 10 years, there will be diagnostic biomarkers uh, based on glycans. So does it seem like linear? So if you have a certain set of glycosylation and then you get done again in a year and you can see it's got worse and that increases your chances of diabetes. So although it is only chance, you can see at least the direction of the path. I think the key, the, the most, the, the best way we can use it at the moment is to do exactly what you said. So look at the individual level and see whether somebody is moving in good or bad direction because we know which glycans increase the risk, which glycans decrease the risk. And if the good guys are going up, this is good. And if the bad guys are going up, it is bad. What we are still lacking, we are still lacking the ability to take a person and pinpoint it to kind of a risk scale, because there are many other factors which also affect glycosylation. For example, approximately 40% of it is genetic. So it's just genes which determine the glycan level. It's not the disease risk which affects the glycan level. So the, the way we kind of promote it now is, this is one of the, the tools to monitor yourself. You know, in addition to using a scale to see your weight or measuring the blood pressure or measuring the, the, the pulse or whatever, you can also measure your glycans and look how they change in response to what you do in your life. And we have a, a number of people being tracked for a long time now. We know that, I don't know, acute virus infection can cause a change, but then it can go down. For example, severe COVID was aging people for even 10 years in a couple of weeks. And most of them recovered, some did not. And uh, influenza can do the same. So severe influenza can, can change your glycom relatively quickly. Um, weight gain, weight loss is affecting your glycans. Um, hormones 
both estrogen and testosterone affect your glycans, but testosterone also affects true estrogen. You know, testosterone gets converted to estrogen physiologically with an enzyme who does that, uh, aromatase. And often people who are taking hormones, they want to have high level of testosterone because this is considered good by some people. And then they block aromatase to prevent conversion of testosterone to estrogen, which is actually doing damage because we need estrogen to suppress inflammation, both men, not only women. So, you know, there's a lot of things which we don't know. And um, we don't know because people do not have tools to monitor themselves. And this is where I see a huge potential of glycans as a tool to monitor what is going on within me. So do we see glycosylation just as a marker or is it a causation? Or is it kind of related to the cause of the disease? So part of it is just a marker, but part of it is a functional effector. Because if you remember from the, when we started to talk, I said most of proteins are modified by glycans. So these glycans are attached to proteins and they change their functional properties. And if we talk about the immunoglobulin glycans, we know that some of the glycans promote inflammation, some of the glycans suppress inflammation. And uh, there is even a therapy. So there is a therapy called IVAG, intravenous immunoglobulins, where immunoglobulins extracted from blood of generally young people, which are suppressing inflammation, are given to patients with some of the inflammatory diseases. And this is suppressing inflammation. And some people do it even preventively. You know, they usually physicians do it because this is not something you can get legally, but they give themselves uh, IVIG injections uh, in autumn. And then this gives them extra energy for the next uh, couple of months to fight infection infections, because you know, low grade chronic inflammation is a huge expense of energy. So this is like uh, inflammation is uh, seeing a part of your body being potentially dangerous. So you think there is an infection, you send the immune system there, and then they destroy everything. So the, the, the immune system is fighting the infection by killing both the bacteria, viruses, but also your own cells. You know, when there is infection, there is a swelling, there is a redness. So there is a fight going on. And low-grade chronic inflammation is uh, small levels of inflammation everywhere. And if you stop low-grade chronic inflammation, you get 20, 30% extra energy, which you can use for other things. So by having the right glycans, you can actually do a lot of good to yourself. But we still don't have the magic pill. We don't, know, we don't have the pill which could kind of improve your glycans. So we can take it from one person and give it to another person. But this is not, you know, there, there are not enough young, healthy people who would give blood to get old people cured with the immunoglobulins. Mm-hmm.